than um, talking about abortion, even though it's sometimes quite an unpopular topic, when George has told us this morning that we're all going to die. So I'm not going to be the most unpopular speaker this morning. Um, uh, and as I said, I'm um, head of RE in a, um, an all-girls Catholic school in Ballon, so um, or kind of Clapham South. Um, and issues like this obviously often often come up. Um, so I'm going to um, do a very teacher thing. I'm going to give you a bit of a starter activity um, and just give you some numbers, some statistics. Um, the British government they released a document at the beginning of June that had statistics on abortion for the last year. So some of these are taken directly from 2018. So they're all statistics about abortion. So I just want you to maybe just 30 seconds, see if there are any of those numbers, um, statistics that are on uh, the projector that you might want to hazard a guess at what they relate to in this document. Hmm? Oh, we can that, sorry. Um, so the first one is one in three, one in five, 200,608, 1,856, 111, 21, and 77%. There we go, so seemingly utterly random. Just see if, uh, if anyone can have a guess. I'll give, you, I'll give you a little 200,608 abortions in the year. Exactly, yeah. So 200,800... <laughs> I can't even, I've forgotten how to even say the number. It's the number of abortions that, that were carried out in 2018. One of those figures, and I think it could be the low one, one of the 111, which is a break. No, well, yeah, no, it wasn't great. I didn't see, actually, I didn't see any statistics there is a on my statistic yeah. Somewhere, I've just lost it from my head now, from the side and out the other. But I think there was some figure that, um, I think I'm on some of the argument. Yeah, there is something that is around 111 or 200 mm. um, were due to rape. Abortion specifically comes from the rape. It's exceedingly, exceedingly small. Mm. I can't be called that because I know it, but that figure is definitely there. It's yeah. Worth looking at. Um, that number relates to a slightly different um, statistic. Any other guesses? Mm. Approval of abortion in this country is 77. So, so would approval meaning how many people agree? Agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I say one in five pregnancies is probably abortion because it's not one in three. Um yeah, one in five pregnancies end in abortion. Yeah. Yeah, right. I don't know what the other ones are. Um, so, one in three is um one in three women will have an abortion in their life. Um, and I think this is why it's such a challenging, yeah, really challenging topic um, to talk about and why we struggle to talk about it because we know that abortion affects the people that we are speaking to. So in our churches, in our parishes, in our schools, in our friendship groups, there will be women that we know, uh, that we may never know that they've, they've had an abortion. But one in three women has had an abortion, so obviously it's seen high. One in five pregnancies end in abortion. Um, we've said that the number of abortions carried out last year as well. Um, 1,856 abortions were carried out after 22 weeks of pregnancy. Um, a, a previous statistic, we, we were trying to work this out and I, we, we didn't get to the bottom of it. Um, that I think that there is a, a very large number of of, terminate, of, of those that, that number that, that is carried out between 22 and 24 weeks. Um, the number does drop after 24 weeks, but obviously um, for anybody that has ever been pregnant, obviously I'm about 30 weeks pregnant myself now, I know that I could feel my baby moving earlier than 22 weeks, but I could definitely feel my baby moving at 22 weeks. Um, so I found that personally, quite difficult to read, um, quite shocking. The 111 um, were selective abortions. So in instances where um, a woman, for, his, for example, has gone through IVF, um, it's quite uh, common to have multiple pregnancies. And so selective abortion is carried out to reduce the number of pregnancies. Most of those are from two to one. So in the case of a woman being pregnant with twins, to reduce that pregnancy to one. Again, I found that a really, really challenging <coughs> statistic to read because I guess 
IVF as a whole, other topic for, for another day, but um, the, the pain a woman must experience in, in seeking and desiring a pregnancy to find out that she's pregnant with two babies and deciding to, to, to kill one of those children is just, it, it's heartbreaking to me. Um, and 77% of the number, um, I'm sorry, 21 is the next number, is the most common age for abortion. Um, so uh, it's gone down one year from the previous year, um, but yeah, 21 is the most common age that an abortion takes place, and 77% is the number of abortions that happen under 13 weeks. So many, many of the abortions that take place happen uh, before 13 weeks gestation. Um, any that happen, uh, again, after 24 weeks are usually down to um, disability. So in this country, it's legal to abort a child up until the moment of birth if the, if the baby is found to have uh, a disability. Um, and just another kind of visual aid for us, see if we can uh, have a little guess. You can sh shout out if you've got any guesses. About 10 weeks, 16. Uh, this is uh, this is baby at 10 weeks um, in the womb. So a little bit further along, this is 16 weeks. That's 24 weeks, so that's the legal the, um, upper limit for abortion in this country. And the last one, very squished, <laughs> is 40 weeks. So just just before, um, just before birth. Um, this is a, a baby born at 24 weeks. Um, and we know there have, been, there have been babies born as early as 22 weeks and have been able to survive. Um, but this baby was born at um, 24 weeks and survived. It's really tiny, you can see the, the hand there next to, next to the baby. Um, and obviously that's again the upper age limit. Um, I've used a very similar activity with a number of classes um, and what I've, what I've generally got them to do is um, show them the different stages of development of life inside the womb and ask them to decide where they think abortion should be legal. And so each picture has, has a number and instinctively they, they choose the lowest you know, 98% of the time they'll choose the lowest because when you see that development of life within the womb, it's really hard to then pinpoint where it is. So they'll just go for the earliest picture. And then when you tell them that actually in this country, 24 weeks is their legal limit, limit the majority of students I've ever spoken to are really, really shocked by that, by that statistic. So I'm going to start by just um, outlining, outlining really what kind of the frame that we're looking at here is and try to try to reframe maybe how I would enter that dialogue and just maybe give you some helpful um, helpful ways that we can discuss this. And as Brendan said at the start, this is a really topical debate. Um, I'm sure what is happening in America has not escaped our notice. And so the abortion debate, and obviously what's in Northern Ireland and recent uh, debate in Ireland as well. You know, this is a really, really hot and present topic um, that we're kind of focusing on. So I would say the main frame um, really is, I, I think some people are just really, why wouldn't the church allow abortion? Because abortion is about women's rights. And the, the frame of this is so clearly about the rights and the autonomy and the freedom of a woman's right to choose that it's really hard to even begin to see where the church could, could question that. Um, and again, like many of the issues that you'll have looked at, it's this kind of insistence that the church, church cares more about its rules and its dogma than it does about the freedom and the rights of women. Quite often in these situations, and we've seen this um, in the debate in America and some of the um, evidence that's been given in, in certain situations, that you know, this is a really difficult decision for women to make, and the church, by questioning their autonomy, is just making this harder, judging women for this, for this decision. And as I said, one in three women have had an abortion. You know, this isn't something that just affects a very small minority of people. There are people sat in our churches, there are people, you know, that we'll be friends with that this is affecting. And it makes us uncomfortable to make a judgment on somebody else. And so that's what the church is kind of accused of in a sense. 
And when we, as Catholics, engage in this debate, we will often start from the viewpoint that life in the womb is infinitely valuable and should be protected at all costs. Um, we are concerned with the rights of the unborn child, and therefore we fundamentally disagree that that child is part of her body. Um, and this is something that I, I was really, really acutely aware of. It, one of the things that I said to Brendan really, really early on, um, and again, if you have, um, if you've been pregnant, you'll you remember those kind of very, very first moments when you start to feel your baby move. And I was trying to describe to Brendan what that felt like. And just like something popping in your, your tummy, not like a kick or a movement, just something. Um, and it's and it quite difficult to determine, but the, the deciding factor for me was it's something that's, that there's a movement, but it's not me. That's, that's all I could kind of define it as, really, that something's moving and it's not me that's moving. Um, and again, that's amplified when you, when you first see that baby on the scan and you see the baby moving and you think, yeah, I've got no control over those movements. I wish I did sometimes. I've got no control over what the baby does and what time the baby wakes up. Um, if I did, it wouldn't be 10 o'clock every night when I'm going to sleep. So, you know, there, there was a really, we really fundamentally disagree that that's something different. And so we start talking about the baby. And so when we're entering into a dialogue with somebody, they're saying, how dare you limit women's rights to freedom and choice and autonomy? How dare you judge her painful decision to have an abortion? And we're saying, but it's a life and it's a human being. And, um, and I think on the very extreme uh, side of the argument, there are people who just believe that that is a pump of cells that has no, that has no rights. Um, I've seen people in America have had t-shirts made that say, you know, the, the clump of cells doesn't control what, how we, you know, my bodily autonomy. Um, which I mean, if we're defining the baby as a clump of cells, I'd also define myself as a clump of cells. Um, but th there's just, there's a very big disconnect there really. So we're, we're right in saying that, we're right in saying that the sanctity of life of the unborn child should be upheld from the moment of conception that is created by God and worthy of respect. Those things are true. But as with, the, uh, as with the debate that we were talking about earlier with assisted suicide, we kind of miss each other when we do that. We're not engaging in a useful conversation because we're talking about the baby and they're talking about the woman and our, our points that we're, we're never really having anything to really talk about. And so what I'd like to suggest is that we start from a different point of view, not forgetting that the baby is um, is valuable and should be protected but if their positive intention is the rights and the value of the woman can i agree with that of course i can i believe that a woman's value a woman's dignity and the freedom for her to choose are really important and so i can start by focusing on the woman and so that's what i'm going to do i'm going to give you a couple of um of suggestions about how we can talk about why abortion is not what is good for a woman okay why to uphold her freedom to uphold her dignity and to uphold her worth i think that abortion is wrong from the woman's perspective um, the first is uh that we can love them both Okay, it doesn't need to be a decision. We don't need to focus on the baby and forget about the woman. We can love them both. The debate in Ireland, I think, did this really, really well. Um, and instead of kind of focusing on, on the life of the life of the unborn baby alone, they really they really worked on this campaign to, to love them both. And that was their catchphrase. That was their kind of phrase that they used throughout, which I, what I thought was really, really beautiful. We don't have to choose between the baby and the mother. As Catholics, we love the mother as well of course we do and we need to maintain this really consistent life ethic um i think a truly compassionate society would really care about that woman's choice and abortion is not always a woman's choice i think georgia mentioned this in her argument as well she was saying that um actually if you feel that you're a burden to society it's not a real choice and so often that's true in um in abortion <coughs> A woman who is in poverty and therefore forced to choose abortion has not chosen abortion. She's chosen to try and lessen her poverty. 
A woman who is in an abusive relationship that has chosen abortion is still in an abusive relationship. The pregnancy wasn't the problem. It was the abusive relationship that was the problem. A woman who is scared that she'll lose her position in her company because she's fallen pregnant has not chosen an abortion. She's chosen not to lose her job. And as a society, we need to look at those issues. We need to look at what is our provision for women who fall pregnant and they can't afford that child? What is our provision for women who are the CEO of a company and are scared of losing their job because they fall pregnant? Are we adequately protected in workplaces? Is there adequate protection for, um, for women in those situations? Really um, scary study in America found that sex trafficking victims were offered numerous abortions through Planned Parenthood and their policy is to not ask questions because they are providing a healthcare service and they believe that abortion is a healthcare service. They will not ask questions about why a woman has come for an abortion. And so sex trafficking victims were going for multiple abortions and no one ever knew that they were captive, that they were in abusive relationships and so just carried on performing abortions. Because we refused to ask those questions, that abuse continued. We, you know, we're, we're kind of failing within in those, in those situations. Um, we need to look at prenatal care, adoption, post-abortion counselling. That's something that the church has been involved in in different, in different spheres. We acknowledge that there is pain attached to abortion. The secular, secular society does not want to acknowledge that there is any pain attached to abortion and so won't provide, um, provide these things. Um, there's some fantastic uh, projects happening in the UK and George is involved in one um, that's attached to life, it's called Pregnancy Matters and um, provides really practical help for women. Um, it provides housing, in-house in training, um, things like helping people write CVs or um, teaching people to do housework and employment skills, uh, free pregnancy tests and counselling services. They speak to over 200 women every month. This is real choice, okay? So not just say to a woman when she asks for an abortion, I'm not going to ask any questions, sort of fail them in that way, but ask them, how can I help you to make a different choice? How can I help you with this choice? Um, I think for, um, for Brendan and I, I know he may have mentioned this in, in a previous talk, we, we um, suffered two pregnancy losses before, um, uh, before this pregnancy, but I have a really vivid memory of um, going to the GP when I first felt pregnant. We had been married um, for two months and I had this rosy image of going and telling uh, a doctor that you were pregnant and, you know, being really excited and, you know, not feeling entirely ready for the situation and things. And I must admit, maybe it was about five o'clock on a weekday evening and I'm sure the GP was very tired and had, had a very long day. Um, and I told him I was pregnant and he said, are you happy about it? Um, and it really shocked me and I was like, I've got lots of complicated emotions going around in my head right now. Um, but of course, of course I'm delighted and I hope that I always, that I always say that. Um, and it really shocked me and, and my, my mum um, is a practice nurse and has been, um, has worked in the NHS for her entire career. And she said that that's, that's the reality of the situation actually, that doctors, um, are seeing women really regularly and actually not every woman who comes into their clinic feels the same way in that situation and, and maybe he was responding out of kind of a protection of himself um, but how different might those situations be if our healthcare providers treated those situations dif differently if i was in a position where i was a little bit unsure of that pregnancy, if I was in a position where I felt a bit anxious, or maybe I was concerned about finances, or maybe I was concerned about the relationship that I was in, I'm not convinced that my GP would have worked very hard to try and convince me that there were any other solutions. I think he would have been quite happy to just sign off and, and refer me to somewhere else. And again, this, this, is, not a, this is not a culture of choice. We're not a culture of real choice. Um, secondly, uh, we acknowledge that abortion damages women. Oh, maybe not. 
Um, I'm going to talk about that in the next one. Um, abortion damages women. As I said, the majority of people believe that abortion is a necessary evil. I would say that the majority of the population, and, and when polled in the past, people have felt like abortion is not the solution that they may choose for themselves or they may choose for their, for their children or for people close to them. But it's something that's necessary. It's kind of a necessary evil. We know that it's really common, and I think we feel really uncomfortable about judging somebody else's painful decision. But what has really struck me about listening to some of the testimonies in America and some of the testimonies in Ireland is that everybody uses this phrase that it's really painful, that it's a really difficult decision to make. And when we see things uh, like Planned Parenthood, or I'm not sure if anybody saw this um, this thing that, um, what's that, Miley Cyrus did with the cake. I don't know if anybody saw that. Um, it was really, really awful. You can search the picture. So obviously the debate in America um, has, has picked up a lot of heat. Um, and she posted a picture of herself, or I'm sure her PR team posted a picture of her, um, vulgarly licking a big cake that said abortion is healthcare on the cake. Um, and this kind of message that women are given over and over again, that abortion is just healthcare, it's just, it's just a normal procedure, it's just part of kind of going to get your, your smear test or whatever else you know, women have to do as part of their health, abortion is just, is just another thing. We are refusing to acknowledge the pain and the hurt and the damage that abortion causes, which is not fair to women, which is, which is not part of um, an effective healthcare. We're told um, constantly that it's a difficult decision, but not giving anybody any support. There have been lots of studies um, and lots of kind of, um, there was one particular study, if anybody's interested, I'll try and find the, the study that was done by um, quite a pro-abortion um, scientist that tried to find that there were no links between depression and abortion and proved the opposite in his study, that um, that there are there are numerous links associated with mental health problems, anxiety, depression, substance abuse. Um, women are hurting from abortions. Um, there was one story that came to mind when I was thinking about this. Um, if you remember, during the Year of Mercy, Pope Francis um, announced that women would be able to go to their priest and confess their sin of abortion and receive absolution from their priest. Um, now that has been the norm in the UK for a long time. Um, although I don't think many women knew that that was, that was something that they could go and confess to their priest about, even though um, for a long time. But in some countries, the, the sin of abortion is considered so serious that you would need to go to a bishop um, to be forgiven for that sin. And as part of um, Pope Francis saying, actually, that this needs healing um, in this year, um, he made this announcement. Boston Cathedral... Uh, said that they were inundated with, inundated with calls from women saying they didn't know that they could come and receive this. And there was something about that story at the time that just broke my heart that there must have been so many women who just silently carried this pain around with them. So many women who just silently carried that shame of abortion and never knew that God's mercy was there waiting for them. Um, I just can't, and I've, Brendan and I have talked about this before, um, and again, a miscarriage is incredibly common, and something, again, that we don't really talk about uh, in our society, but there is a real pain and a loss and a grief uh, that women experience when they go through miscarriage. But I knew deep down that I hadn't done anything wrong in that situation, and I can only imagine the pain that a woman must feel when she knows that she has chosen that for her child. I can only imagine what that must feel like. And that there are women sat in our parishes who have not gone to confession, who have not gone uh, to receive God's mercy in those situations is just heartbreaking. Um, I've heard the argument that we shouldn't speak about abortion because it might upset people. Um, and, th and this is true in schools. We, you know, we don't know the situation of the people that are sat in front of us. But imagine if we had that attitude with other situations. Imagine if we said, we can't talk about that because there might be somebody that this upsets. If we never talk about mental health 
issues. We've never talked about racism because there might be somebody who's been offended by it. If we've never talked about any form of injustice or intolerance because there might be somebody that's been offended by it. These things, these things remain silent and they remain hurting. It's only by talking about these things and allowing it to come to the surface that we can really, we can really receive healing in those situations. Um, so you might, my question, I guess, to Miley Cyrus would be: if, if abortion is healthcare, then why is it causing so much pain, and why can we not talk about, talk about it? Um, and finally, finally on this point, um, I would say that authentic feminism is pro-life feminism. The traditional values of feminism were justice, non-violence, and non-discrimination. I would say a woman has the right to control her body and is worthy of dignity and respect at all stages of life, even if she is in the womb. The tragedy of our world right now is that most abortions are carried out on girls. We look at the situation in India and in China, particularly in China, where they have a massive imbalance um, in, in births of um, men and women. We can see that this is a feminist issue. There is no way around it. There's, you know, sex selective abortion is happening here in the UK. Uh, there are some hospitals that when you go for your, uh, your scan at, um, at 20 weeks and you can find out whether it's a boy or a girl, the hospital policy is not to tell people if it's a boy or a girl. So the hospital policy in, in some areas, particularly in London, is that they won't reveal whether it's a boy or a girl because they know that rates of sex selective abortion are really high in those areas. So we know it's happening here in the UK, we know it happens um, in other places. It is a failure of feminism to not recognise that abortion is hurting women. It's a failure of feminism to not recognise that abortion is happening mainly to women, to girls. Um, I saw um, a, if you could just go to the next, there's some fantastic um, signs uh, floating around kind of their pro-life um, movement but i really like i've seen this sign in, in a number of different situations that our liberation cannot be bought with the blood of our children if our freedom my freedom as a woman has to be bought at the at the cost of somebody else's life that's oppression it's not liberation if any in if any in any other situation we knew that our freedom was impacting the liberty of somebody else, was impacting the freedom of somebody else, we would be horrified. Uh, and abortion is a symptom of women's oppression, not a solution to it. In those situations that I mentioned earlier, there are many situations where women feel that abortion is their only option. And again, that's not choice. If they fear that they're going to lose their job, if they fear that they can't afford that pregnancy, if they fear that their abusive partner is going to respond badly, then that's oppression. We're just feeding into that cycle of oppression. It's not good for women. Um, and generally, I think abortion, uh, the way that it is at the moment, is, is a sign of failure, not a sign of liberty. Just to kind of, um, to move, move the debate along a little bit, I focused on, on why, why abortion is so damaging for women and why abortion uh, for women's rights and women's liberty is not a positive thing. Um, but we, we can't ignore the fact that there is another life at play in this situation. Um, and this is particularly why I'm, why I'm proud of, um, of being Catholic when it comes to this debate, because wherever the Catholic Church has established itself in the world, it has tried to be a voice for the voiceless. Whether that is people living in poverty, living in, in kind of isolation and fear, the Catholic Church has tried to defend those rights, and rightly so. Okay? We should always try to speak for the weakest in society. And the victim when it comes to abortion is literally voiceless. We must be the voice of the voiceless. We must be able to speak, um, speak for them. I think um, Pope Francis, uh, said recently um, that we have a widespread utilitarian mentality that enslaves the hearts and minds of many, that requires the elimination of human beings, especially if they are physically or socially weaker. 
when we look at statistics related um, to abortion, the shocking thing is the number of, of children aborted that have disabilities. Today in this country, 10% of children with Down syndrome will be born. There is an enormous amount of pressure on women to have an abortion when they find that her baby has any form of disability. There was a story um, that surfaced recently um, in the news of a woman who was told that her, her I can't remember what condition her baby had, I don't know if anybody saw that story, was it spina bifida or um, something? She was, she was told on about 15 occasions by NHS staff to have an abortion, 15 times. Not once in any of those encounters did somebody sit her down and say, this is the, this is the alternative. Um, and women that I've spoken to who have children with Down syndrome have had shocking encounters with people who have questioned why they didn't have an abortion. Can you just imagine for a moment that one woman had told the story, she was in a supermarket, she was paying for her shopping, and the woman in front of her looked at her baby and she said, did you not find out before? Oh, oh. To look at her child and to say that, I mean, it, it, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, I'd, yeah, and particularly when it comes to it comes to Down syndrome, we've had our own experience with with um, with the complicatedness of how how screening takes place. Um, it's so subtle and it's so uh, kind of manipulative. I received a letter from the NHS um, that said you need you have to come and have this blood test, and you get lots of letters when you're first pregnant and there's lots of tests and lots of scans and obviously you've never done this before so you have no idea and um, so I went for this blood test and the, the nurse started asking questions explaining to me what this blood test was for and I was I paused for a minute and I said so you're telling me this blood test is only to check for Down syndrome this is not I, I thought it was like to check my health or you know there was a number of things they might be checking for and one of the things through this blood test they might be checking for was Down syndrome so I was like, so you're telling me that, this, that, that you've called me in, I've got a 15 minute appointment with a nurse, that you're gonna send this off and somebody else is gonna spend more time uh, looking at this blood and it's just to look at Down syndrome. And she was like, yes. I was like, this is, this is un an unreal amount of resources that go into, um, into, this, into this situation. Um, and the other thing I, I quite enjoyed was our sonographer, uh, when we went for our 12 week scan, I had to take a measurement of the back of the baby's neck, and that's again an indication of, uh, of Down syndrome. But we were there for a long time, and the baby would not move into the position <laughs> that he needed to be in. And we were saying, hmm. <laughs> the baby doesn't care either. So <laughs> we were saying, just leave it, we don't mind. But and he was trying to jab around, trying to get, um, trying to get this measurement, um, which in the end, Obviously, he couldn't he couldn't get which we were we were quite happy with, but um, that there, there's a there is a real subtle um, I think a fear surrounding this really that that we really have to test for this um, for this condition and that would be the worst thing in the world and and um, I'd quite love to be in the position where um, I was able to have that conversation with a healthcare provider to say actually this is really 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 not a problem for us. Um, uh, but many people have not thought about this issue before. Many people have not been in the position, and it's really scary when you're first pregnant. And you know, obviously, we bow to the authority of doctors who've trained for many, many years. Um, so being being informed is really, really essential. Um, it really interested me when I was kind of looking for um, some quotes and things that the atheist uh, philosopher writer uh, Christopher Hitchens. Um, was uh, very pro-life and it, it surprised a lot of people, it, it annoyed quite a lot of people who were close to him and he said very matter-of-factly in order to terminate a pregnancy you have to still a heartbeat, switch off a developing brain, break some bones and rupture some organs. It's really sometimes as simple as that. <coughs> the termination of a pregnancy is ending a life, whether you know whichever way you look at it. And again, it doesn't need to be a religious argument to um, to understand that. Um, I have just to kind of end. I have um, my best friend is a vegan, and she quite often says in passing, 
And there'll come a time when we look back as a society and we will be horrified that we killed so many animals. Um, I really enjoyed my pepperoni pizza and it goes, so I'm not on the same, I'm not on the same uh, wavelength um, as her necessarily. Um, but I quite often think of that argument. I quite think that you know that in this community, in this in this circle, they're quite often talking this way. But there is a there is a growing waking up to um, to the impact we are having on the earth, and I think. Um, veganism is, is part of that, to say, actually, we don't want the impact that we have on this earth to be damaging to future generations. But my hope and my, and I believe that, that um, hopefully this will happen one day, and I think that we're starting to see that in pockets in America. I, that I read a study recently that said that young people in America are the most pro-life generation that has ever, that has ever been since um, the Roe versus Wade kind of legislation that we will look back on the 200,000 lives that were lost every year from abortion in absolute horror. There will come a time when we look back and we look back on it like we look back on the Holocaust or like we look back on the slave trade and we will say, how could people let that happen? Um, and ultimately, I think that it's a tragedy, a tragedy of failure of women and failure of victims, failure of the weakest in society. Um, and I do hope there comes a time when we, when we look back and we think, wow, how could a generation of people allow that, allow that to take place? Um, yeah. <laughs> a lot to think about there in terms of key messages. Just for a moment, so maybe five, ten minutes, we'll see how the discussion is going. Would you please talk to the person next to you? If the person's just arrived, please do welcome them. Um, if you're sitting next to someone new, introduce yourself again. What are the, in your mind, the key frames, positive attention, reframes, react, thoughts, questions, reflections related to what um, to the stimulus Laura has given her? So about five to ten minutes discussion, and then we'll get back together uh, for discussion and, and Q&A.